Well, hello everyone, again. It's been a while, years, right? I can only hope those years have been as good to you as they have been brutal to me. Make no mistake about it, I am deep in the shit. I'm facing extinction. And the cautionary tale of how that came about deserves a deeper dive in another video, so let me talk about this for now. And please excuse any audio hum I haven't succeeded in filtering out because, like so many things, there doesn't seem to be much I can do about it. When I left you and YouTube, it was after the invasion of social justice types into the atheist and skeptical community and other communities where everything had to become a plus. Atheism plus postmodernism, neo-Marxism, and radical subjectivism in the guise of social justice which is an odd position for people who deny certain things and phenomena exist when they also claim that truth itself is a subjective social construct. After the utter failure of Marxism, it left no monument but piles of bodies, fields barren of crops, and a bad taste in everyone's mouth. And its academic proponents decided to engage in a little rebranding of that poison, crossing out the word class and replacing it with the identity of the day like race and gender and power became a function of one's self-reported victim status. Then we got gaming plus gender politics. Those were the years when feminists began barging into mostly male spaces like gaming, and even though it wasn't a house they built, decided it was their divine right, you know, because vagina, to entirely redecorate and police everyone's language, and so eviscerate the fine, ages-old tradition of male bonding through shit-talking each other. Guys think smack talk is funny, but apparently some women with fine-tuned indoctrination can't hack it. And now there should be a law, and that law is everything has to meet the norms of third-wave feminists. No one is being brought together by this. Nothing is being built. Identitarian grievances of race and gender are used as a pry bar to separate people and rip institutions and traditions apart, plank by plank, raise everything to the ground so they can build something. What is being built, if anything, has never been clear. Obviously, very little mental energy is being spent on being constructive, so they can concentrate on job one, which is destroying everything. People who can't do criticize, and people who can't even criticize break things. Imagine, if you will, an entire city burned to the ground in order to plant a sad little autonomous zone garden at ground zero. Maybe that doesn't seem to be an equitable trade-off to you. And that's why, according to them, you're the problem. If only because you realize that losing everything of real value for a couple wilted weeds sprouting from tweaker crap isn't exactly a good deal. Despite delusions of creating utopia, these lunatics can't construct a compelling argument for any of their iffy assertions, which is why their first recourse is to violence, either the proxy violence of silencing people, deplatforming them, harassing them, or interfering with their employment, or the more direct kind of violence when they get the opportunity through numerical advantage to beat people down in the street. I saw all this coming like a slow-mo train wreck in real time, but watching this happen piecemeal did not give me the foresight needed to predict that practically all institutions, from academia, including STEM, the media, Hollywood, comic books, and virtually every other avenue of persuasion and narrative would fall to this bullshit operating under the collective label of wokeness, including the federal bureaucracy, which is the permanent government of the United States. Nothing is sacred and therefore safe. Children's books, even the classroom itself, become just another means of early indoctrination. Nothing is so venerable or apolitical that it can't be hijacked and repurposed for the message. And that message is that the world is divided into polar opposites of oppressors and the oppressed, villains and victims, and the oppressed victims can do whatever the hell they want provided they are punching up. And the distinction between the two, in the finest tradition of isms and phobias, is less about what people actually do and more about what they look like while they're doing it. Under the banner of social justice, equity, and diversity and inclusivity, we've created one of the least tolerant, most thin-skinned, and gleefully brutal uncivil societies where the very idea of virtue has been perverted to include destroying someone's reputation, terminating their employment, 
and completely destroying their life, all because they didn't put made-up pronouns in their social media profiles. Perhaps not even that, as often people find themselves vilified not for their opinions, but for what a woke witch hunter assumes to be their opinion based on some other opinion, or merely their unwillingness to engage in compelled speech, and they are then labeled a Nazi, white supremacist, or whatever ideological junk drawer they want to drop people in. Sometimes it's just based on how people look, and there's a word for that. None of this is in any way abstract. Witch hunts don't actually kill any witches, but they certainly kill a whole bunch of people accused of being witches. When people hunt down and destroy figments of their imagination, everything is collateral damage because there is no legitimate target. Canceling people may seem like an online blood sport, sort of a first-person shooter for virtue signalers and online psychopaths, but its effects are very, very real. Maybe the people exercising their sense of power and control by interfering with people's livelihoods, breaking the bonds of family and friendship, and turning the most mundane of casual opinions into a make-or-break purity test think this is contained. But none of this stays online. As with the hair-trigger self-righteous struggle sessions that began in academia around made-up grievance studies, this is spilled out into the society like a pathogen after someone left a door propped open at the Wuhan Virology Lab. Now you not only have to interact with these people online or in your classroom, but when you go get a cup of coffee, when you take Fido to the dog park, and maybe, if you are very, very unlucky, in your place of work. And so, after being doxxed, threatened with lawsuits, and understanding that those who are self-consciously political can't help but make everything personal, all of which is perfectly common in this age for any nail that ever so slightly sticks up, I backed away before any of this interfered with my livelihood. Which didn't work out quite according to plan when the very malicious type of people I was trying to avoid became management. I worked for the U.S. Department of Commerce for two decades within the International Trade Administration. The specific agency, the Office of the Chief Information Officer, was going through convulsions and after a series of ineffective, even demoralizing leadership, rebranded itself as TSI, not to be confused with the Transportation Safety Institute, which it was. The agency in this final iteration ended up with a black woman as CIO whose major contribution was the introduction of diversity and inclusivity training and paranoia into the workplace. I ended up with a brittle, blonde-haired white woman wearing problem glasses as my immediate supervisor who actually introduced doing jazz hands into meetings in lieu of clapping hands and then admonished me not to be political when I didn't go along. I shit you not. I was surrounded by women who essentially formed a clique, one with an agenda, an agenda so clear that people they questioned told me to watch my back. People I knew for years told me their new job description was shutting up and keeping their heads down. I lost my 22-year career with the federal government and for some reason likely to do with my pigmentation, the configuration of my genitals, or my lack of green hair, it was decided I was too male, too white, and been there too long. I was also divorced and have no children, so I was able to be made a target without harming women and children. I will tell, I have to tell the story of the eight months of bullying and gaslighting I endured, which began the precipitous decline in my health. At least as a cautionary tale, as well as for the irony in the wokeness that I saw coming years prior invading my workplace and making me marked for ritual sacrifice, and there was not a damn thing I could do about it. Just in case things couldn't get bad enough, a couple months after I was terminated, COVID descended upon the world with all the closings, lockdowns, and social hysteria that came with it. In a desperate bid to get the hell out of there, I sort of snapped, and threw out everything that I considered to be dead weight, too hard to pack and transport, and that included my books, every knick-knack I owned, and a lot of my personal art. And then I got stuck, sitting alone, rotting in a hollowed-out shell of an apartment, divested of everything who reminded me of who I was. 
watching the world go utterly batshit insane in isolation while I went utterly batshit insane in isolation. Jordan Peterson once explained in one of his lectures that people don't fall into anxiety and depression from just one thing. They have the misfortune of being hit by different crises coming at them from different directions at the same time. It's never just one thing. You end up between a rock and a hard place in a catch-22. You don't know whether to shit or go blind. And all the while you can't reach out for any sense of stability or sanity when the very world you no longer feel part of has completely lost its mind. In the end, people needed to be double-masked and quadruple vax, except when they were running around looting and burning cities to the ground. People didn't make any sense. Nothing made any sense. And I realized that the sense of safety and security that gives us courage to go from day to day is largely an illusion. At least mine was. As is our sense of self. At least mine was. I had a well-defined self-image of someone who was an avid cyclist racking up 100 miles a week commuting to work. I lifted weights, I was thin and athletic, and I never shied away from any physical challenge. But in the eight months that I was bullied and gaslit in my job, and the resulting hard stop that was the lockdowns, where there was nowhere to go, and even the gym around the corner was closed for the duration and didn't survive the lockdown, even the feeble little gym on the top floor of my apartment building closed. There was a year when I did little more than exist, eating, sleeping, and watching the world that I no longer felt part of pass by and implode. And it was somewhere in that haze that I removed the magazine from my pistol and threw it behind some clutter in the bedroom closet just in case the spirit moved me. Not only did I no longer feel competent, in any way in control, but I felt barely human. And as I blew through what little savings I had, I felt like a styrofoam packing peanut trying to navigate through the surf. I applied for unemployment, which was refused when the same supervisor who engineered my termination lied and told the unemployment office that I was terminated for inappropriate conduct. And you know exactly what that implies. It's the gold standard of gotchas, and the fact that I never interacted with women in the workplace in any way that could even be misinterpreted as, as sexual harassing, and certainly not sexually harassing, that I wouldn't even compliment a woman on her appearance because I knew better, is largely immaterial. As we know, the fact that it never happened is no impediment to these kind of accusations. The narrative is not reality. It's a tactic of weaponized lying. Still, you really have to admire that woman's dedication to my destruction. So, in the end, and it felt like the end, and it still does, I lost everything, including my sense of self. It took eight months of bullying and gaslighting at work for me not to know who I was anymore, and two years in the brutal Northern Virginia lockdown for my health to completely unravel. The lockdowns were a wall that I ran straight into, I experienced various symptoms of a syndrome known as deconditioning from being forced to sit alone and worry. The stomach problems I began developing while I was being harassed and worried turned into chronic inflammatory gastritis. And the gastritis made an empty stomach excruciatingly painful. I gained weight from being forced to be sedentary, weight that put further stress on my body. My dietary stable became plain white rice as that was pretty much all I could tolerate. I got edema. I became pre-diabetic. I developed ventricular complexes of the heart. I physically fell apart at the very time when I needed strength and resilience to save myself. I felt like someone trying to keep his head above water with his arms cut off and a cinder block around his neck. I got to the point where, when I could sleep, that I would hope I wouldn't wake up. And sometimes I still feel that disappointment in waking up in the morning. Nights were the worst. Having tossed most of my lamps and not wanting the brightness of ceiling lights, when the sun would set I would navigate in the dark, mostly from memory. 
Day-to-day tasks that I would do effortlessly and automatically became increasingly difficult. The only question was whether this was due to deconditioning, deep clinical depression, or a combination of the two. I found myself fatigued and breathless for no particular reason. I was destroyed to the point where I could feel it in my bones. It's probably for the best that I didn't make a habit of appearing on camera, as I certainly wouldn't do that now as I absolutely look like hell. Somewhere during the long unraveling of the lockdown, I stopped running a comb through my hair and eventually had to cut through tangles like the Gorgon Knot. I couldn't be bothered with day-to-day maintenance like shaving until I started sporting a Jack Murphy salt and pepper beard, which makes me look like a latter-day Karl Marx, if Karl Marx was someone squeegeeing your car window for spare change. All I've managed to do in the past couple years is move laterally from frying pan into the fire, never finding much respite or security. This is what happens to people who are canceled. This is what happens to people sacrificed for diversity and inclusivity. This is what happens to people who are put away in isolation because of social hysteria over, among other things, a virus. We don't just blink out of existence. We don't retire to an island somewhere. We suffer, wither, and take far too long to die. A bullet in the back of the head would be a mercy. So, what can I do? What can I still do? Well, this. I do have something to say from the point of view of someone that was finally sacrificed to the whims of the woke gods. I have experienced every bad outcome of the lockdown save hanging myself. I have been racked with anxiety and hopelessness, been in the depth of depression I never thought I would experience. At times, I have given up completely. I can now second-guess myself into a state of utter paralysis. At one point, someone engaged me on Twitter gleefully impining that I was a shadow of my former self, which is, of course, true. I have been beaten both physically and mentally. And isn't that the point? You strip a man of his self-image, his self-worth, his sense of agency, his livelihood, and throw him into exile, and then mock the bones you find cleaned up flesh and scattered by animals. These are the rules of this sick game that has been imposed upon us, which is that the best that the woke can manage until they actually have the power to throw people into gulags and shoot them in the back of the head. One of the hardest things I've experienced in all this is realizing I need help. The only thing harder than realizing that is asking for help, which brings me to my purpose for discussing how horrible things are. I've hit bottom and my coping skills were overwhelmed a long time ago. I'm now so limited in what I can do, but I can still write and I can still speak. And so I've decided to do this in an effort to save my own ass. Making videos and asking for your patronage is my last Hail Mary pass before I drop off the edge of the world. And perhaps I still have something to contribute to raise this exercise above straight e-begging. I have to put myself out here and not only ask for your support in creating content. I need your help because as I move from situation to situation, I don't know if I'll be able to maintain internet access. I want to work, any work that I'm physically capable of. If there are any unemployment opportunities, I want to reach out for them. I need encouragement. I need advice. Due to the decline in my health, I have applied for disability for social services aid, for housing. I need advice from people who have walked this path of destitution and homelessness, and I want to know how did you survive. If you can help me making videos, if you can help me survive, my Patreon link is in the description box below. And if you are able to inject some fast cash into my increasingly dire circumstances, there is also a PayPal link. Thank you. And I hope I will keep seeing you.